Hi, folks. Nice to see you. Sange chodon soge chonam la janchu padu dane kapsuchi dagi chen yangi pe sonam ki rola penje sange drupa sho sange chodon soge chonam la janchu padu dane kapsuchi dagi chen yangi pe sonam ki Jola penji sange drupa sho sange churon sogi churon ha janchu padu dani kapsuchi dagi chen yangi pe sonam ki rola penji sange drupa sho. This session, we're going to talk a little bit about the way the five Buddha families are reflected in things like the empowerment ceremony. And we're going to go into what happens during empowerments a little bit. And um, I think that everyone here has been to some sort of empowerment. Is that right? Or at least to like a little Jainong or something. Is there anybody who's never been to one? Yet yeah, one, maybe two. Yep. And I think sometimes it's um, it's helpful to know what's going to happen before you go in, but almost never does someone sit you down and say, guess what's going to happen? <laughs> you just kind of arrive and then various things are happening. There's all this movement, there's saffron water, there's grass. You're just kind of like, what? <laughs> so um, in a perfect world, we would be slightly oriented at least so we weren't so bewildered but that almost never happens so at least one of us gets to be prepared ahead of time that's good <laughs> um i can't go into like tons and tons of elaboration because you kind of need to get your foot in the door and then get commentary but there's some general things that i think if you can kind of name them it can make the experience more grounded the next time you do it so it's not like you take an empowerment once, is it? Even if it's a practice that you do every single day, say Tara's your gal, you do Tara every day, that's your favorite practice, your go-to. Basically, any time one of your lamas offers Tara empowerment, you take it again. Why do you take it again? <laughs> Does anyone know? You already have it, why do you take it again? To keep it um, new and like hitting refresh on the browser <laughs> and make it run a bit more smoothly. And also it's quite likely that in between times, some of the vows and commitments might have been uh, degenerated in some way. So it would renew the tantric vows, the Bodhisattva vows, etc. Exactly, exactly. Um, I mean, we can renew our own Bodhisattva vows by ourselves once we've taken them initially from a lineage holder, but it's easier and kind of, I guess, psychologically easier to take it again from a teacher and, and so purify your bodhisattva vows. There's that famous quote, um, is it from Nagarjuna or maybe from Atisha? Now I can't remember, where they say the bodhisattva vows are like an incredibly precious golden vase because they are so precious very easily dented, you know, gold is very easily dented, but also very easily repaired, you know, it's soft metal. So you get a bump in there quite easily, you know, I mean, the first Bodhisattva vow is what, refraining from praising yourself and criticizing others. Basically, you have a long conversation with someone, you probably are going to break that vow in one conversation. Yeah, unless you're really mindful and on top of it. So does that mean that you're a lost cause and you could never be a bodhisattva? Of course not. If you could keep them purely, there would be no need to have them, right? There's a built-in assumption that you will fail, right? Assume that you will fail. And there's a million restoring ways. So you can restore it by yourself, you can restore it within guru puja, and you can restore them within um, an empowerment itself. So that's a huge reason to take an empowerment again and again. Um, you're also restoring your connection with the deity and de deepening your connection with the deity. And you'll find that the more times you do the empowerment, the deeper it goes, because you know what's coming up next. You can actually focus and not just kind of be disoriented. You know, the Lama or the translator for the Lama will say, now visualize this. And you're like, oh, yeah, I remember this part. 
and you're not just kind of fuddled, <laughs> you know? So the first time you take any empowerment, you're doing the best you can. You're thinking, I agree. I accept, I would like this empowerment. I will try and follow what the teacher says in the steps of the visualization. The various implements and accoutrement that go around, I will try and connect with, but really I have no idea what's happening. Yeah. So your main thing is to just keep thinking, bodhicitta, I agree. Yeah. But then the second time, the third time, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. So Anytime you can take an empowerment that you already have, I really, really suggest you do so. There's so many layers of benefit, but that first one is huge enough reason in and of itself, purify and restore all of your vows. It's huge. So that's handy. Um, it also kind of restores the connection with the teacher. So if this is one of your teachers, and of course they will be one of your teachers if this is the first time you're taking an empowerment with them, but if they already are, still worthwhile because you're reinforcing this bond and you're reinforcing this sense of the meeting of minds of the outer guru and the inner guru pathway of conversation and you know as years go by with certain teachers some of them feel close and present the whole time you know them and sometimes some of them you kind of feel them drift away they're not drifting away you're drifting away and sometimes it's just logistical, right? Like even with COVID, like we don't see our teachers in person so often. And so sometimes we need that interaction to kind of reinforce the bond. But it is really important to remember that anyone you take an empowerment from becomes a Vajra guru, not just a regular guru. So not to take it lightly, yeah. All right, so there's some steps. Um, hopefully some of this is a little bit familiar, but this is a, a really good chance to ask questions about things that you've seen in empowerments. And if something that's okay for a, a public audience, I will totally try to answer. And if it's not, I will tell you it's not. Okay, <laughs> so here we go. Okay, so empowerments and initiations are synonymous. And basically it's procedures and permissions to do certain practices, right? So this little excerpt is from the world of Tibetan Buddhism by His Holiness. And it sounds like it would be a general text about Buddhism, but it actually talks about Tantra very clearly in quite a lot of detail. So the world of Tibetan Buddhism, I really recommend. So a valid Mahayana Vajra Guru is vital to receive an empowerment from. Regarding some of the recommended qualifications for a Vajra master in Tantra, he or she should be a person who guards his or her three doors, body, speech, and mind from negative actions, who is tamed and gentle, who is well-versed in the knowledge of the three baskets and well-practiced in their subject matter the three higher trainings of morality, concentration, and wisdom, and one who possesses the two sets of 10 principles, inner and outer. So those lists um, are pretty available, but what you're really looking for is the three higher trainings. Yeah, so if you find this whole list and you wanna look through this whole list, this is excellent, but the main thing you're looking for is, do they have ethics? Are they focused? <laughs> Do they have wisdom? Now, you can't really know if they have realized emptiness. You can't know that. But you can know by the way that they teach that kind of ring of truth, that kind of experiential conveyance where your little inner lie detector isn't going off, where you feel like um, whether they've realized it or not, they have precision. So you're, so you're looking for that when you're in general teachings with a teacher. And then of course, are they, do they seem to have some sort of inner structure, some sort of direction that they're going that's intentional? Can they meditate? These are things you can't really know. And then of course, you'll think of someone like Lama Zopa Rinpoche, who teaches in a completely non-linear way with a very abstract structure. And you wonder, does he have concentration? Of course he does, but <laughs> he is a bit of a magician. So, um, so with someone like Lama, what you're looking for is kind of the threads, the way they all come together. And this is kind of what he does is he weaves kind of a tapestry in his teachings. 
So he'll start with one idea and then he'll go off on what seems to be a tangent and then he'll go off on some story and then he'll go off on some quotes and then he'll give a random oral transmission. But after the end of the whole thing, you realize there was this really elegant tapestry that he wove that actually was quite cohesive. It was just in the moment trying to track him. You were like, where is this going? <laughs> Especially if you're used to a Geshe teaching where it's very point by point, very linear and organized. So it doesn't mean Lama Zopa Rinpoche doesn't have concentration. He's just kind of operating on a different wavelength. For some people, they love that style because it's so experiential and creative and kind of in tune with the students in the moment. It's not like he's got like a, a PowerPoint, right? It's not like he's got notes in front of him that he's reading from. Like it's very much spontaneous to the needs of the students in front of him. And it's a very magical way that he teaches, but it's not everyone's style. So you just can think, He's either your style or he's not, but that doesn't mean he's good or bad. It's just about affinity, yeah? And similarly, some teachers that are very regimented and organized, that can be a bit off-putting for people and feel kind of constrictive. So it's really, um, listen to your inner guru, is there resonance? But it's so important that the first thing you do with a llama is not an empowerment, right? If you're meeting a llama, your first interaction shouldn't be, now I'm at an empowerment taking an initiation from them, right? Your first interactions with them should be a general teaching, like a public talk or a lumrim or a course, hopefully many, <laughs> many. And through that process, you come to get to know them and you can watch how they interact in between sessions and you can read different stories about them on the internet and you can ask them maybe even for a personal meeting one-on-one -on -one and just really get a sense of them. Because when they later are in a deeper relationship with you and then show behaviors that trouble your mind, that troubles your practice. Yeah, so you want to make sure that the sort of behaviors and idiosyncrasies and human seeming foibles and all the different aspects are things that your mind has the space to bring into the wholeness of your practice. Yeah, and if their spectrum of behavior are not things that you can bring into the wholeness of your practice, respectfully, don't take them as a teacher. But with respect, knowing that some people really do resonate with them. It, it becomes a delicate thing, doesn't it? And you can see the potential for all sorts of pitfalls and all sorts of dangers and Buddhism, like everything else is full of human beings, right? <laughs> and anywhere that there is power, there will be people who abuse power. We know this, we're grownups, yeah. But just to kind of make sure that we're not having rose colored glasses, just because it's the Dharma. The Dharma is perfect, the people who practice it are not, right? <laughs> So eyes wide open. So you've got your eyes wide open. You found yourself a good Mahayana Vajra guru who has the lineage, who's offering an empowerment. Then what happens on the day? What's actually going to happen? So I'll show you some of the steps. And hopefully this is stuff that you've seen and maybe you know some things about it too and you can add. But um, empowerments initiations, the term in Sanskrit is abhishekata. And this might ring a bell from the Chenrezig Sadhana when there was an empowerment section within the practice. There was a Bishakata within a mantra garland. Anyway, it's translated as empowerment, but can also be called like an anointment or a permission. There's a lot of different translations. The basis of all tantric empowerments is Mahayana refuge. So there is no tantra without Mahayana motivation, bodhicitta. There is no Tantra without refuge. So this is, of course, Buddhist Tantra, not other forms of Tantra. So the purpose of an initiation, just as the realization of bodhicitta, the aspiration to attain complete enlightenment for the sake of all living beings, is the entrance to the practice of the bodhisattva vehicle in the sutra system. In the same manner, receiving an empowerment or initiation is only the entrance to the practice of Tantra. The general format of an empowerment ceremony is quite uniform among the three lower Tantras, but in the highest Yoga Tantra, 
because there is great diversity among the tantras belonging to this category, there are also many different kinds of initiations, which serve as the ripening factors specific to those various tantras. So there's three stages, and these are pretty across the board. All empowerments have these. This first stage is to bless the ground. And this is the job of the Vajra master. You don't have to worry about that, but it's good to know that it happens. So this is the place where the initiation will take place is blessed with strong prayers. If a sand mandala is built with a connection with the initiation, the completed mandala is also blessed by the Vajra master. So during this time, then also the Vajra master will do their own self empowerment or self entry practice. And while this practice is a practice that anyone who has completed an approximation retreat with fire puja can do, when a Vajra master does this practice it has particular power due to the depth of their practice. So some of the empowerment substances are also blessed at this time. So this is usually early in the day of the empowerment. So if you're going to the Dharma Center, you know, it's the, the empowerment is scheduled at, I don't know, one in the afternoon. You might think, I'd like to go to the Gompa early and have a look around and do my practice and get my seat together. And you might not be allowed in. Depends on the teacher. Yeah. Depends on the Lama. Some of the Lamas are happy for there to be hustle and bustle behind them while they're doing their preparation. And some aren't. But if you come to the Dharma Center and they're kind of some, I don't know, robust older students with like this, like bouncers outside a nightclub saying, sorry, can't come in. Um, don't be offended. The reason is that the Lama is in there preparing the space and preparing the substances. And the first thing that you're gonna have is before you even come into the Gampa, a little bit of saffron water is gonna be poured in your hand and you're gonna take it and swoosh, yeah? Like it's mouthwash and then spit it out somewhere where people aren't walking. Some people say it's okay to go ahead and swallow it, but that blessed saffron water came from the Lama a few hours before. They did a whole blessing procedure of that to help kind of both psychologically and physically cleanse so that you enter into the sacred space a bit more prepared. Yeah, so I'm thinking you've seen this. Yes, the saffron water to cleanse before you go in. So that all is prepared in those early stages. And self-empowerment of any deity, the practice that the Vajra master does in the morning, it's gonna take a couple hours, right? It's a, it's a kind of a long process. So there might be a lot of comings and goings of various attendants and helpers. There might be all sorts of smells and bells emerging from the gampa. So um, it's just something to know that's happening. What can happen is people are so excited to see each other at a Dharma center that they get kind of gossipy and chatty and are around the gompa kind of being um, busybodies or whatever, you know, and you want to say to them, let's just really enjoy the space. Let's enjoy the time and let's kind of like bring the volume down, get into a more contemplative space, but not in a tight way. Yeah, not in a tight way. So as with so many things in the Dharma, there's the advice you tell yourself and there's the advice you tell other people and they are not the same advice, <laughs> yes. unless you're in charge. Yes, if you're in charge, same advice, right? But you, these are things to say to yourself is keep a calm, happy, peaceful, contemplative space before entering into the sacred space. But if other people are being chatty and obnoxious, you don't need to be the Dharma police and like be all up in their business and tell them to shut up because that also ruins the vibe. Yeah. <laughs> so the main thing is to keep it really friendly and really spacious. And if you feel like you can skillfully get people to calm, do so. But if you don't have any particular power in that context, just let it be. Yeah. But just know that whenever there's a big ceremony like this, just like before a big llama comes somewhere, it, it, there's a huge energy that happens in the community and it really stirs people up. Some people are really excited and happy. Some keep people get really tense and really grumpy. Some people get kind of weepy, but there's just a lot of intense energy that comes up. So if you can sort of try to be as, ground as it is, grounded as you can be, that can create a little oasis 
and maybe will have a good influence on other people. Do you know what I mean? Have you guys seen that sometimes? The like the madness around the llama or the madness around the empowerment? Like everyone just chill, <laughs> right? But there's just a lot of energy. So it's hard to know how to navigate that. And there's also just anxiety of you want to do the right thing. You want to be polite. You're also excited to see your friends, yada, yada, yada. Okay. So know that there will be much human drama. Prepare yourself. <laughs> Okay. Here's um, Jado Rinpoche at Land of Medicine Buddha last year, or last year, just earlier this year, actually. Um, the mandala of the deity of the empowerment is placed in the center of a mandala house. Can you guys see this mandala house? It's like a very tiny, very simplified version of a mandala. So we normally think of mandalas as flat, like sand mandalas, or flat like a picture, but they're, also, they're actually three-dimensional is the way we visualize them. So there's a simplified three-dimensional mandala and then a picture of it is placed in the center here. And at various points in the ceremony, the curtains of the mandala house will be open or closed or semi-closed depending on what's happening. And the image may be represented by grain or sand or cloth or ink and um, around or near the mandala house will be a number of offerings. So the Vajra master does a number of preparatory meditation rituals in the space where the empowerment is to take place prior to the students entering the space to receive the empowerment. So you'll see over here is the normal teaching throne where the Lama sits, and then here is a lower throne. So they sit lower while they're doing their self entry and then they arise as the deity and as the deity come and sit on the throne when the actual empowerment starts. <clears throat> Excuse me, so the second stage, the preliminary initiation, the Vajra master gives refuge and bodhisattva vows. And if it's a highest yoga tantra initiation, then tantric vows. The, man, the master introduces the disciples to the mandala of the deity by describing it. And that description forms part of the visualization that the disciples are supposed to hold. In these introductory stages, it happens quite quickly. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that happens very quickly at the beginning of the empowerment. And a lot of it's in Tibetan and you're expected to repeat after the master in Tibetan. And you may think, but I do not speak Tibetan or my Tibetan is very dodgy, you know, what to do. You just try your best, but you're mainly thinking, Yes, I want to renew my refuge. Yes, I want to renew my bodhisattva vows or take them for the first time. So the main thing that makes these plant on your mental continuum is receptivity. It doesn't mean you have to say it perfectly. So don't get uptight about that. Just, I agree, I agree. And of course, if you don't agree, you wouldn't be there in the first place, right? So you're thinking, yep, I agree. Yep, I agree. Like that. All right. Then comes, um, or also in this first part, right? This is all in the first like 10, 15 minutes. There's sometimes gonna be a gektor. And that's when one of the helpers comes around fumigating the space with a black frankincense and taking small ritual cakes out together with the Vajra master like throwing mustard seeds at them. Have you guys seen this? It's um, to dispel inner and outer obstacles to the empowerment taking place. So the Gektar is, it's a little bit full on and it's a little bit pagan seeming, but what do you think? What you think is, I came into this room with all sorts of preconceptions and superstitions and expectations, all sorts of on myself, on my community, on the teacher, on the practice. I just came in all wound up. All of that, I'm sending out the door. So it's actually a really powerful time to say all you gex, yes, gex are just hindering spirits. What actually hinders you? Your negative states of mind. All you gex, get out, here's cake. Follow the cake out the door. Yeah, really, that's what's happening. Now, there also are hindering spirits who are literally spirits who literally want to interfere with religious practices but you don't wanna to get too superstitious and weird about it or give them too much energy or, you know, just like, don't get funny about it, okay? Just think, 
they are beings with minds and Buddha nature, just like us, wish them well, give them cake, send them out. Yeah. I remember Kadrala saying such nice advice about this to one woman who was really worried about all sorts of spirits and things in her house. And she said, what's the best practice to do to get rid of spirits in the house? And Kadrala said, send them compassion. Yeah, send them compassion and then shift your focus. Yeah. So a gektor is mainly for your own mind. Yeah, of course, it also is helping clear the space if there's any interferences. Some teachers, like His Holiness lately, hasn't been doing a gektor as often. He says uh, it also does the trick to just meditate on emptiness. Yeah, also does the trick. But if you see this where there's attendants walking around with smoking, billowing things and little cakes and mustard seeds and all sorts of noise, your job is to just stay centered and think all of my rubbish, all of my negative states of mind out the door. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do, you, do you have any questions so far about these bits? Um, do, do we also do get to before a retreat, not just, um, you know, in part as part of an empowerment, but to purify before a retreat? Yeah, yeah, you do it before a retreat. You can also do it if you move into a new house. You know, you can do it if you've just built a new house or just renovated. You can do it if the space feels a bit weird. Yeah, get tours are handy and it's, it's a short, fairly short practice but um, you need to have a highest yoga tantra empowerment to be able to do it. But yeah, yeah, you do it before retreats for sure. Can I just yeah. ask, if you are doing a retreat and you want to do gek tour, but there's only one of you, you haven't got an assistant, is it all right if you mentally remain on your cushion, but actually go out in your garden with your cakes and incense and stuff? Well, you, you, you physically do it. You just have to kind of, you know, have the text and be like, I'm doing this mantra. Okay, put it down and like fumigate and then come back, look at the text and then, you know, do, do, do. And yeah, it's, it's awkward, but you can do it by yourself. Thank you. And obviously you can't throw mustard seeds at yourself while leaving the room, right? <laughs> I mean, you could, it would be amusing to watch, but um, you're throwing the mustard seeds out the door and then you stand yeah, yeah. up and take the cake out and, you know. Yeah, so you just have to break it into jobs an individual can do, but you still do all the jobs. Yeah, cool. Thank um, you. I asked my teacher once when I wanted to do a fire puja at my folks' house, and my folks are not Buddhist, but they have somewhere a person could do a fire puja. And he's and I said, can they help me? They're not Buddhists. I mean, let alone having tantra, can they help? And he said, yeah, if they're not reading the sadhana, you know, if they're not looking at the sadhana and they're not looking at the substances they can hand you a plate of rice, you know, yeah. they can hand you stuff. So also you can have helpers that are not necessarily knowing what on earth's going on and just say, hey, can you take this outside for me and put it on that little platform out there? Thanks, yeah. okay, bye. <laughs> you know, if you've got a good friend who doesn't mind your weirdness. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Sure. All right, so get tour, get this one. Um, I'm outside because it was um, to do a get tour for a stupa blessing. So they often um, get tours happen all over the place. So this one was for a stupa, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, also, are going to be offering body, speech, and mind. And you guys will probably have seen this before big teachings, not just empowerments. So when there are a body, speech, and mind offering happening, and they have the mandala, and then they offer a statue, and a text, and a stupa, and a financial offering, and then the kata, if you're not helping, still think you are offering those things, right? That you're genuinely requesting the empowerment. So that's the main thing to think, is I am offering all of the beauty and attachment objects of the universe, I very much would like this empowerment. Yeah, and you don't have to make it more elaborate than that. Just, I'm offering all that is beautiful. May I have this empowerment? And then at the very end, there'll be a Thanksgiving empowerment where you think I'm offering all the beautiful things in the universe. Thank you for this empowerment. Yeah. Um, do you have any body speech in mind questions? You've seen that process, yeah? A few of the senior students prostrating, they're going up and it's a whole, extravaganza up there. Anytime that there's people moving about, there's lots of energy happening. And if you can be a little place of peace, it really helps the group atmosphere. So if you're not one of the helpers, 
really consciously think, oh, the new people especially will get unsettled by this ground. Yeah, like really stay together with the chant leader, really try and do your meditation as good as you can. That kind of stuff can really help the group experience for you guys who have done it once or twice or know some Buddhism. Yes, because there will be brand new people. There probably be even people who aren't even Buddhist yet that just sort of like karmically wound up there it happens they you know and theoretically you should understand renunciation bodhicitta correct view have checked out the lama know what you're doing sort of that does not always happen <laughs> that often doesn't happen and some random guy off the street will be like i'd like to go here today you know because they've got the, the guru hooked them in so um for the sake of the new people especially just staying really grounded as an older student can be a huge support so a Vajra master can perform two levels of initiation ceremony. The first is called Wong in Tibetan, which loosely means belongs to me. And this is what we generally think of as an initiation, a ceremony that gives someone the right to do the practice. But the term initiation can also be used to describe the Tibetan Jainong, right? So a Jainong is also a ceremony that grants permission to practice a deity, but it's not considered like a full initiation because it does not have the vase initiation, which we're gonna talk about. So at the Jainong, the Vajra master simply introduces the disciple to the deity through the blessing of the deity's body, speech, and mind. To receive a Jainong in a particular class of Tantra, we need to have already received an initiation in either that class or a higher one. So what this means logistically, usually in the advertising, it will say whether it's a full initiation or a subsequent permission or Jainong. But the way that it's easiest to find out is a Jainong is probably two to four hours. An initiation is usually two days. Yeah, and they're not necessarily all day, but like an initiation is usually a couple hours in the preliminary day and you're given grass and protection cords and all sorts of stuff and you're preparing. And then the next day is the full initiation ceremony. It goes many hours. There's many visualizations. You get bonked on the head with various things. You're drinking saffron water. All sorts of stuff is happening at an initiation. At a Jainong, there might be some water at the beginning as you come in, um, no grass, no protection cords, just a gentle visualization. And you might repeat after the Lama, the mantra of the deity. You might, you probably will renew refuge in Bodhisattva vows, but it's not nearly as uh, elaborate a thing. So if you've had a great empowerment, yeah, a great initiation that goes over a couple days, then once you take a Jainong, you can add that to your practice and arise as that deity. But if you've never had a great empowerment and you take a Jainong, then it's like a blessing and you can't actually do the full practice until you've received a big initiation. So there are Jainongs in all classes of Tantra. Um, some deity practices only exist as Jainongs, not as full um, empowerments, like for example, Vajrayogini is a Jainong. So usually you take Haruka first or Yamantaka first or something that's a great empowerment first, and then you add Vajrayogini, stuff like that. So anyway, Jainongs and Wongs are different, although similar. Um, with His Holiness, um, as you know, with a lot of his um, initiations in Europe, they tend to be two to four hours. Some of mm. them, some of them, you've got the saffron water, you've got the cord, um you've got the um you get you get given the sadhana you get given the sort of image of the particular deity so um because of the time scale is that does that also tend to be a jainang then you we'd have to look at it case by case right yeah we'd yeah. have to look at it case by case sometimes this holiness will do um a great empowerment and then a bunch of jainangs back to back Mm, you know, yeah. all the same, right? I think you even did that a couple of years ago um, online. So when you're online and there are substances going around, think that you're taking them. Like stay engaged, don't like get up and have a cup of tea. Like if they're holding a picture or they're, um, you know, giving something out or there's a flower, mm. think that you're receiving that. Be very present, mm. especially with online empowerments. You need to be super engaged 
to really receive it. Yeah, but whether it's a Jainong or an empowerment, we'd have to look at it case by case. Yeah, there's a little bit of variation. Usually yeah, I, it says in the, in the advertising, usually. Yeah, yeah I, I was also wondering about the online initiation because I think I was a bit surprised. I mean, it seems if some people say that it depends on the particular teachers, some say, yes, it's like a full initiation and even although it's online, you've received it. And some seem to think, no, you have to be there in person. So I was interested that in, in COVID, you know, I mean, mm. I've attended one or two initiations during COVID online. And I suppose it just feels very, very different from being in actually the same room as the person, that's all, but yeah. It, it can do, but um, if you're taking it really seriously and you like, you know, block out that time in the day you know, put on clean clothes, have a shower, make your altar particularly nice, add some flowers, put the computer up high, do your prostrations, sit properly. It actually really can feel the same, but you have to make sure you're giving yourself all the supports to make that happen. And it might be that you even get yourself a little red blindfold and a little flower and you, you're really prepared and like close the door, tell your family, I'm doing an empowerment. I love you. Somebody else is cooking dinner, you know, and just really that way. Cause I think if you're sitting on the couch and you've got the dog and it's the same setup as when you're watching Netflix, it's hard to feel the profundity, you know? So make it sacred and then it will feel sacred. Um, and with his holiness, he says it's a real empowerment. So it's a real empowerment. It's just that not all teachers, um, I think, feel up to it, doing it in that way. You know, like, is their mind able to reach the whole world and give anybody who is at the empowerment in the whole world the empowerment? His holiness can. I'm not sure that all teachers can. So they don't all offer it in that context. They think, well, I can offer it to everybody in this room right now. But once they leave the room, my consciousness is not stretching far enough. You know, I don't know how these things work, but we trust his holiness. Yeah. At an empowerment, your first empowerment might be highest yoga tantra. It might be. And you've never taken anything lower before or anything before. You go straight into the deep end. Mm -hmm. But at that empowerment, you're taking refuge, you're taking bodhisattva vows, then you're taking tantric vows, then you're doing the initiation in a linear sequence for sure. Mm -mm, yes. But yes. in that same day. <laughs> yeah, that ambush yeah. then. So just wondering. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it's totally, and it's not that you go through the four classes of tantra, like I'm going to practice lowest tantra for five years and then second tantra for five years. It's not like that at all. No, mm. they're all just tools in your tool belt. So the lower tantra ones are when you really want more health, long life, and support for calm abiding and special insight. The higher tantra ones are really for the quick path to enlightenment, to clear those obscurations very, very swiftly. And even if it's your first tantric empowerment, you still need to make sure you're very grounded in the preliminaries, particularly renunciation. Because yeah. as you start to get better at meditation, it's easy to get lost in it and forget the point is bodhicitta. The point is to get out of samsara. The point is to realize emptiness, right? You can just be like, wee, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Does that, does that make sense? I think as long as the motivation is like, I'm helping, I'm doing that because I want to help others or helping others not out of my interest is all like, yeah, the bodhicitta and emptiness and relaxations. So I think I get it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just gently, gently, and um, I think you're doing just fine. Well, I, yeah, I just wanted to mention about about that um, empowerment. Um, you you mentioned very early on yesterday about guru yoga. If you if you took it as an empowerment and not as a blessing, then you have the commitment to do the succession guru yoga practice three times in the morning, three times in the evening, ever after. Um, and succession guru yoga is not a long practice. It's you know three rounds in the morning takes about twenty minutes. Three rounds at night takes about twenty minutes. Um, it's basically a way for you to keep all of the samayas. So you're able to fulfill the commitments related to the five Buddha families. So the five Buddha families each have some samayas related to each of them. There's a really good commentary by Lama Zopa Rinpoche that you can get on the FPMT shop to just kind of like dig into the practice kind of verse by verse. 
and just see what does that mean? You know, some of it's obvious, right? It's refuge in Bodhicitta and Four Immeasurables and Perfect Human Rebirth. Some of it's very obvious, but there's going to be some stuff in there that you're like a bit of a head scratcher. Yeah. And the tantric vows in particular are a little bit bewildering and need commentary. Um, so uh, myself and other teachers do teach on it, but we don't usually publicize it. Yeah. Um, so make sure you ask your teachers for commentary on it. And if you want anything about the vows, um, probably the clearest, simplest one that's easy to get is by Serme Kenser Lozong Tarchen. And it's just called Six Session Guru Yoga. It's only available in hard copy, but you can get it, um, you can order it online. It's just called Succession Guru Yoga. And you'll know you have the right one because it's got a yellow border and a like a light blue square in the center with a statue of Vajrasattva on it. And it's just a really excellent book. And probably your Dharma Center would have it hidden away somewhere in their Tantra section. And then you can be like, what is vow number 11? And just like look it up and be like, oh, okay. <laughs> And you may or may not feel clearer, but it'll at least give you something to go on. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Look, I know sometimes you, you just kind of jump in the deep end and you're like, wait, what did I just do? And um, <laughs> so does that mean I've missed my chance that I've kind of blown no, it? No, <laughs> you're right. You're right. And, you know, when in doubt, take it again, purify it, start from scratch. Yeah. With all of this, never feel like now that you have more knowledge, that now you feel overwhelmed that you haven't been doing it right. And now you just give up because it's hard. Yeah. Think, oh, now I know. Good. Try again. Yeah, just try yeah. again. And tantric practices like that, where you sometimes have a ton of momentum and all sorts of cool stuff happening and connections with teachers, and then some dry years where you're just trying to keep the continuity and you're not having a lot of inspiration and you're feeling really like, I don't know, like a hypocrite or, you know, something. And really just keep remembering that your approach to practice is as important as the practice. Yeah. Like, what do you do when you meet confusion, when you meet boredom, when you meet, you know, sort of like dry years, how, what is your approach to practice as well as just the practice? So um, you sound like you're, you're enthusiastic and curious and you know, willing to dig in deeply. And I think that's really the main thing. Yeah. Well, there's and one just coming up with your hand. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, we no, just I've tidy. Got, up I've got we another go. bite of, of the apple. <laughs> Look, and you've made connection with Tantra, which is a, a rare and awesome thing. So yes. just no, keep this, coming back to it. This course is a, a great thing to do to me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, at the initiation ceremony, you get the red um, blindfold and the flower. Mm. And I'm wondering really how you're supposed to look after that. I thought this holiness said to keep the flower with you at all times, but I'd, it's so fragile. What do people normally do? Because I was thinking, well, is there a holder? Do you wear it around your neck? What do you do with it? And I've actually ended up uh, putting it on the altar, but that's not with me at all times. And I'm, I really worry about that. Yeah, the, one of the tantric commitments is to have all the implements on you at all times. And what most of us do is we just have a little picture and it lives on your phone or lives in a little laminated thing in a pocket, or, you know, it's just a picture of all the tantric implements, very, very tiny printed out in a pocket. The flower, um, you can just think you've received it, really feel that you've received it. And then what you did putting it on the altar is very practical and that works. So with these things, it's, a lot of it boils down to it being a reminder. Yeah, a reminder to practice, a reminder of who you are now as a tantric practitioner, and a reminder to try and see things through the lens of Tantra, which is connecting with the fundamental purity of things. Because they're empty of inherent existence, they can become enlightened. Yeah, because the environment came from the minds of sentient beings, and it is empty of inherent existence, the environment too can be purified and made into a mandala. Sound, smell, touch, everything. So you're just holding these objects and or at least owning these objects or a picture of these objects as a reminder that now you're going to attempt tantric vision as best as you can in your life. Yeah, so there's, um, there's a quick way to purify mistakes with Tantra, which is called the Samaya Vajra practice. 
it's Maya Vajra practice and the and you can find that on the FPMT shop the PDF very easily and the mantra is just Om Prajna Trikha Hum simple as that Om Ma Prajna Trikha Hum and it's a green deity um, and you can do that if you feel like oh no I haven't been doing that correctly but best is if you can do a full approximation retreat of one of your deities because then you can do self-empowerment yeah you can do self-empowerment purify all your vows all yourself so that's one of the benefits of doing one of these retreats but in the meantime samaya vajra is your friend and of course vajrasattva yeah. the main purpose of receiving an initiation in a particular deity is to receive permission to practice that deity, to visualize ourselves as the deity, to use the hand implements of the deity, such as the Baj and Bell, and to study commentaries on the practice of that deity and do the practices associated with it. So in general, it's a permission and it's also a support and a connection to go ahead and do these in their full-fledged way. So what we have in initiations, all initiations have a vase initiation. Only highest yoga tantra has secret wisdom and word, but the vase initiation is what is related to the five Buddha families in a very specific way. So each of the sections are related to purifying an aggregate, purifying a delusion and planting the seeds for those wisdoms we were talking about last session. So there's um, all sorts of different subdivisions of buzz initiations, and you can look at that later. But basically in Kriya Tantra or Action Tantra, there's just the water empowerment and the crown empowerment. Then the second one adds ribbon, Vajra and bell and name. And then Yoga Tantra adds the Vajra master empowerment. And it's from this point onward that you have to do succession guru yoga every day. So for yoga tantra and for highest yoga tantra, because you have the Vajra master empowerment, then highest yoga tantra gets these extras, secret wisdom and word. So if you're looking at that list, water, crown, ribbon, Vajra and bell, name, <clears throat> and Vajra master, the first five, those are related to the five Buddha families. So Kriya tantra, the first level, only has two of the five initiations within the Vaz initiation, and both are meant to purify the body. If we do an initiation in the second class, you have these additions. So jumping to the bottom, it says they are called Vaz initiations because at the end of each initiation, the disciples are given a sip of water from the blessed Vaz. So the vase looks like this. It does not look like what we would consider a vase. This um, is a Tibetan vase. It's called a bumpa in Tibetan. There are two types, one with a spout, one without a spout. But upon drinking the blessed water, you think your five aggregates are purified and now you're able to visualize the deity. Yeah, so you really feel like the permission comes with the water. And then the second initiation, in Kriya Tantra um, is the crown initiation. And in the place where the initiation is taking place, there will be a representation of a five sectioned crown. And this signifies the five Dhyani Buddhas and with each Dhyani Buddha associated with one particular aggregate. Our ordinary appearance is of a body and mind with five contaminated aggregates. In the resultant state of Vajrayana practice, these turn into the five purified. So it looks like this, and um, sometimes it's in a bowl, sometimes it's folded up, and usually it's placed on your head, right on the crown. So as it touches your crown, or as you visualize that it touches your crown, think that the five aggregates are purified. And you'll also see, like in Lama dancing, this crown worn and the, the meaning is the same. It represents the five Buddha families. All of the empowerments are purifying and ripening the seeds for the five Buddha families, but then each of the subdivisions kind of emphasizes one. Does that make sense? So when you're getting the little sips of saffron water throughout various empowerments, if you can think nothing else, think my five aggregates are purified, seeds for the five wisdoms are being ripened or placed. Yeah, just think that. And then you can add specificity as time goes by. 
but yeah, purified. So um, do you have any suggestion that we, if someone is going to take the initiation next week? Be ready to do a practice that you don't fully understand and it will take a while to understand it. And it will need a lot of reading and studying and asking questions while you're doing something every single day that you don't fully understand. And if you're happy to do that, that is wonderful, but just know yourself. Because when you break a promise, your heart hurts a little bit. You know, you're not being punished by any external figure. Your mind punishes you. Yeah, your own guilt punishes you. The Buddhas love you regardless. But just know that that, that is a huge thing that I see with older students is that they have all of these commitments and they're either flippant about them and think, oh, no, it's just a blessing. It doesn't matter. Or I sort of took it as a real empowerment, but now I've decided it's a blessing five years later. And they have all sorts of complicated, distorted excuses in their minds, which are really unfortunate. Or they like nose to the grindstone, do it perfectly every single day with tightness and sadness and confusion and they don't know how to access the resources and it's like a bag of rocks. And then some do it happily, joyfully and are studying at a pace that is sustainable. But that is a rarer case, strangely, <laughs> yes, to do it happily at a sustainable pace, weaving in elaboration and depth as they find space in their mind for it. That's what we should aim for, but um, just make sure you know yourself. Yeah, if what you're doing already feels like too much, probably don't add something that will feel like pressure rather than inspiration. So. Definitely, thank you very much. Yeah, other, other thoughts? Make it joyful, I guess, is, is my point, you know, and this whole thing about your approach is as important as the practice. Really keep that like happy, curious, inquisitive, like beginner's mind. I know it's such a cliche, yeah, Zen mind, beginner's mind, but keep that beginner's mind that doesn't feel afraid to ask questions, even if you've been practicing your you know, whole adult life, you know, just, just ask for goodness sake, you know, you learn stuff when you learn it. Yeah, and, um, and seek out the teachings you need to make your practice have more depth. And don't feel pressure to do all sorts of elaboration if the way that it's going now is perfectly nourishing and seems to have good momentum. It's just add more when you feel space for it. It's almost like if you get bored with your practice, it's an invitation to add another layer. Rather than a bad sign, see it as a good sign. I can add more richness to it because it's familiar enough for me to get bored. But if you're not bored, don't mess with it, right? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So we'll go ahead and uh, dedicate. Janchu sam charim poshe, ma ke panam ke gyochi, ke pan yam pa me pa hi, gone gondu pawasho, toni dawarim poshe. Ma ke panam ke gyochi, ke pan yam pa me pa hi, gone gondu pawasho. The wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel source of every single benefit and happiness in this world. The incomparably kind Supreme Tenzangatso, may you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining and preserving and spreading Manjinas victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers, honoring the three sublime ones, savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. Thank you very much, Venerable. <laughs> so on behalf exactly. of Land of John and on behalf of every participant, we really thank you for your teaching. Thank you very much. Yes, thank, thank you. you. And please much. support Land of Joy. They're so kind. They're <laughs> such a beautiful place. So please support Land of Joy. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you.